All right, everybody, sing it from the top. Sing it together. How sweet it is to be in the Sweet 16. Hey, Tennessee's on to the Sweet 16. A bonus basketball show here on a Saturday night. This is Locked On Balls. You are Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, good people. Welcome into it. A bonus episode of Locked On Vols, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Eric King. Going to be a little shorter here today. Going to recap Tennessee's win over Duke and on to the Sweet 16. Appreciate you guys for listening wherever you find your podcast, making this your first listen. Please subscribe to all those channels and please subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. I uh, really, really appreciate you guys there. <clears throat> all right. So Tennessee's on to the Sweet 16. How about that? How about that? Tennessee's on to the Sweet 16. And, and let me start off by saying this. And I think that you guys can all agree with me because, you know, Vol fans, Tennessee fans are listening and watching this show right now. Tennessee can beat anybody in the country. Tennessee can also lose to anybody in the country. That's, that's the level of play that we've seen this year. But when Tennessee plays at its best, and Tennessee's still not at full strength right now, obviously, without a starting point guard. And to lose a starting point guard in Rick Barnes' system that late in the year, I mean, it's it's devastating. But you're still not full strength. But when you're playing inside out, when you're ugling up games, when you're playing more physical than your opponents, good things are going to happen to you. You know, Duke, Duke and Tennessee are very similar basketball teams. Duke plays inside out. Duke plays defensive-minded basketball first under first-year head coach John Shire. Very different from the Duke basketball team that we have seen in years past with Coach K. Now, will that be the mantra of John Shire or Duke? I don't know. But this year's Duke basketball team played inside out, obviously two seven-footers. But the two seven-footers couldn't be any, any more different, right? You have Lively that is a defensive-minded guy first. Zero points in this game, 11 rebounds. I don't have his... Let's see here. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up right now. A lively. So he had no points. He had 11 rebounds and he had two blocks. Okay. I thought he had more than that, but you have that guy who is a, just a, a defensive presence. And then you have <clears throat> Filipkowski, Kyle Filipkowski, who finished with 13 points on the day, eight rebounds, but he's obviously the offensive threat, but you play inside out. If you're Duke, you don't have much backcourt help outside of Jeremy Roach. You play defense first. And, and that's what Tennessee does. You know, sure, Tennessee's got some shooters, you know, when 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 Z, Zakai Ziegler's playing, when Santiago Vescovi's hitting a shot and everything, but, you know, you've got the big on big matchups. Tennessee threw Uro, Tennessee threw Adu, Tennessee threw Olivier Cumball, Tennessee threw a little bit of Toby Awaka, all at Phil Kowski on Saturday, as we knew that it would. And Tennessee was able just to beat him down and beat him down and beat him down. And sure, you know, the national media and some of that look, that look on Twitter and social media who aren't Tennessee fans who are just... Uh, tuning in to watch some tournament basketball, they're going to say, man, you know, Tennessee's assaulting Duke and nothing's being called. And again, I, I understand this is a Tennessee show, but I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm pretty right down the middle. At least that, that's, that's kind of what I aim to be always. You guys know my style. I think there were a lot of missed calls on both sides. A lot of missed calls on both sides. There were flops on both sides. Santiago Vescovi flopped. Phil Kowski flopped all the time. Josiah Jordan James in the first half, they called a uh, they, they they did not call a foul on one of those air balls. Are you kidding me? I mean, the, the replay showed all hand, right? Uh, but Uro certainly did foul Phil Kelsey a lot, an awful lot. But Tennessee out physical Duke here on a Saturday. And when you're playing up against a young team, four starters in that, in that starting lineup for Duke, and you're playing up against a lot of 22 and 23-year-olds for Tennessee, it favors Tennessee when you're playing physical and when you're trying to dirty up a ball game. That is why I thought this game would go one of two ways. I thought Duke would either beat Tennessee by 25, or I thought Tennessee would win by a couple of points. D dirty it up. Make it ugly. I did not account for, in this scenario, Olivier Comwa going off for 27 points, and his second half was the reason you know Tennessee was able to you know win by, what was it, guys, 13 points or whatever. How about that effort? But but again, I'll get to him in a moment. But Tennessee was able to rise to the occasion, did not let the the name on the front of the jersey deteriorate their plans, and they just went and they 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 won the game the best way they knew how was to slow it down, be physical, and just grind it out. And Tennessee was able to do that. Uros on Flopkowski, I've mentioned that just a little bit. Jeremy Roach's foul situation. How about John Shire playing him for 34 minutes tonight? He picked up his fourth foul 
with like 12 minutes left in the game. Are you kidding me? And he left him in for so long, and you thought for a moment, you thought for a moment that he was going to foul out in this basketball game. But the officials didn't even go to the monitor to, to look at that. They, they pinned it on somebody else. And, and I'm not going to sit here and say that they should have went to the monitor. I don't know if that is monitor worthy. I don't know if that's eligible to go to the monitor. I don't know. But Duke caught a break there big time. He ended up not fouling out. But he played the last 12, 13 minutes with four fouls. And I'm just shocked that John Shire left him in to play that long, right? And, of course, they were down without Mitchell in the front court for, uh, you know, in the starting lineup in that game. They still had a lot of talent. So... I just, you look at Tennessee and, and Duke shot 50% almost in the second half. Duke shot 49% from the field in the second half. Duke shot 43% overall in the game. And the field goal attempts difference early in the second half, Duke had like, I want to say like 15 to 17 less field goal attempts than Tennessee had. But they were shooting at a high clip at like 50%, but they just weren't getting shots off, right? They ended up only uh, only getting eight less shots taken from the field in Tennessee, forty nine shots compared to fifty seven shots, but still that disparity was was the the gap was a little bit more early in the second half. But Tennessee just wasn't allowing field goal attempts. The defense was stingy. Olivier Comois, I mean, goodness gracious, right? Holy smokes! Like, what what are you doing, bro? Um, I, I don't have the splits here, and I wish I did. Actually, I do right here. Okay. Uh, Olivier Comwa in the second half, he had 23 points. In the second half, Olivier Comwa was 8 for 10, 3 of 4 from 3-point range, 23 points, 5 rebounds in the second half. How about that? We remember Olivier Comwa against Texas. We remember um, you know what he did jumping up. He, even rebounding that game was very impressive, if I'm remembering correctly. I'm pretty sure that was one of his good rebounding games because when he started SEC play and he was like, 15 to 15 over a two game span. He only had like one combined rebound, and I'm pretty sure he rebounded pretty well in that game as well, uh, the Texas game. But we haven't seen him go 20 plus, but twice this year, Texas in this game. Olivier Comwa is capable of getting you a double double every game if he tries really hard, but he's not going to. He's capable of scoring in the low teens and getting, you know, high rebounds, but he's not, not a very good rebounder, to be completely frank. But is he capable of doing 20 plus? Absolutely. Can he do it every game? No. You can't count on that every single game, but boy, did he show up at the right time for Tennessee. Man, did he show up at the right time for Tennessee. And Santiago Vescovi, six points in the second half, but in the first half, boy, he was on it. Eight points, 14 points overall in this game, four of 11 shooting, not horrible but not his best. All four of those are three-pointers, and he just ran, and he just ran, and he just ran, and he tired out the Duke defense. This was a physical football game. This was a gritty uh, football, football mind, football mind, a gritty basketball game. This was a a tiresome basketball game, and it came out in Tennessee's favor. So, you know, congratulations to Tennessee. How sweet it is, right? 28 total fouls in this basketball game. Uh, I thought it was going to be a whole lot more at one point in time, and there were a lot of fouls that were not called either way. I'll say that for sure, but Tennessee moves on. Taking down Duke in the round of 32, 65 to 52, the final score. Tennessee moves on, and we'll wait to the winner of Farley Dickinson, the 16th seed that just took down Purdue on Saturday night or on Friday night, and Florida Atlantic, the 9th seed. Those two teams play on Sunday, and uh, we'll talk about that, and we'll go over some more from this basketball game here in the next segment, the final segment here on a bonus episode of Locked on Vols. Uh, Tennessee's on the Sweet 16. How about that, guys? Really, really exciting. First time since 2018-19 for the Tennessee Volunteers. And you can win you some money, whether you're betting on Tennessee or just the rest of the field to play throughout the NCAA tournament at FanDuel Sportsbook. The tournament is heating up, and now is the perfect time to download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's America's number one sportsbook. Because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It is safe, it is secure, and it is super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores, even three-pointers drain. These include, you can bet in markets such as the spread, the money line, the total, the over, the under, individual player props such as points, rebounds, assists, three-pointers made, or you can, in so many more exclusive bets, like a two-by-three deal, two three-pointers scored in the first three minutes, 
four fouls issued in the first 36. Whatever the case you want to do, you can do all that at FanDuel Sportsbook. Plus, they let you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with same game parlay. Don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, guys, welcome back into it. It is a bonus episode of Lockdown Vols, breaking down Tennessee's 65-52 to win over Duke to advance on to the Sweet 16 as my phone uh, rings right here, and uh, and uh, I'm going to put that on vibrate. Apologies there. Um, I, I, Before we get back into this game and what's to come for Tennessee, and boy, oh boy, is it just a, a dream scenario uh, for Tennessee and trying to get to the Elite Eight. We'll get to that in a moment. I do want to talk a little bit about my backstory, and this may be news to some of you guys, and to some of you guys who have followed my work maybe at the radio station since I started uh, back in 2017, maybe for those of you guys that know me uh, personally, you, this is not a surprise or this is not news to you, but I have a big-time Duke background. Uh, my A lot of you guys ask about the, the bobbleheads behind me if you're watching on YouTube, and some of you guys have asked about this bobblehead in particular. I'm holding it up if you're watching on YouTube right now. You see it. Um, if you're if you're listening, it is a bobblehead of a man, and his name is Bob Miller. That is my uh, grandfather. He passed away a couple years ago, and um, I'm fortunate to still have um, <clears throat> my two other living grandparents on the other side, and and I love that. I, I'm 30 years old, and um, I, I I was able to grow up with four grandparents, and it was awesome. But my grandfather, who is the bobblehead here, and uh, my grandmother, they passed away a couple years ago. But my grandfather here, Bob Miller, he went to Duke biggest duke fan in the world and um sorry i had to throw my phone on the ground because it kept buzzing biggest duke fan in the world and so he raised our family as duke fans right his side of the family which is you know my mom that's his father and so growing up man i mean i went to cameron and door all the time um <laughs> i i know a lot of you tennessee fans you know will get frustrated by this and um that's why i'm telling the story now that tennessee won right um but it is what it is right i mean i went to cameron and door once a year maybe not once a year, but every, at least every other year for a large portion of my childhood. I've been to Cameron Indoor Stadium probably 10, 15 times. I've gone to see Duke playing the ACC championship game in Greensboro, North Carolina in the 2010 season when they went on to win it all. Um, I One of my favorite memories is taking my grandfather back uh, to Duke in the summer of 2017 for the final time before he passed away and uh, just spending that time with him and um, – He's awesome. He's a huge reason why I became such a big sports fan and why I'm doing what I'm doing today. Not the only reason, but a huge, big reason why. And if you ever notice in my backdrop, sitting beside my bobblehead of my grandfather, Bob Millard, is a bobblehead of Mike Krzyzewski, Coach K. And I always have those two sitting ne next to each other, side by side. And uh, because there's even a uh, there's even a, a, another story to this layer, too. I mean, one time when, when my grandfather was kind of nearing the end and it was his birthday, one of my cousins wrote a letter to Duke University, to the athletics department, and said, yada, 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 my grandfather, Bob Miller, class of whatever it was, he was a part of this, this uh, <laughs> he was a part of this uh, fraternity, yada, 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 season ticket holder, yada, yada, you know, all that type of stuff. Anyway, it's his birthday. Could Coach K sign this birthday card for him? And Mike Krzyzewski uh, signed a big old letter for my grandfather and wish him happy birthday. And that, I thought that was just one of the coolest things ever. I mean, that was like when he was when he was super old. But anyway, I had these two bobbleheads sitting behind me side by side, Coach K and my grandfather, because my grandfather obviously idolized Coach K. Now, so I grew up and I went to tons of Duke games and one half of my family is big time Duke fans. Um, also, I grew up in East Tennessee, was at Neyland Stadium all the time. Can remember going to Tennessee basketball games in the early 2000s and in the 90s and me and my dad would go from the from the top all the way down. <laughs> you guys a lot of have those same memories and everything. So I say all this to say that I have a Duke background, and this game in my family was big, obviously. And all week long, they kept saying, well, who are you rooting for? Who are you rooting for? Who are you rooting for? And you guys know my stance. Uh, this is very boring, and I get it. But since I joined the media, I have a business mindset. I have a media perspective. Um, really, the only team that I root for like a fanboy anymore is <laughs> the Atlanta Braves. <laughs> um, so I was just like, you know what? Um what's good for business is for Tennessee to win. And, and my listeners and, and the viewers and the subscribers of allquest.com and listeners of the radio station where I get my income and people I interact with on a daily basis, man, shoot, I want you guys to be happy. You know that Tennessee winning makes you happy. Tennessee winning makes you happy. 
makes our engagements fun and it, it's good for business. And so that's kind of how I answered all those questions. But so many of the times you guys want to know more and more and more about, you know, people like me or, or people, you know, on TV or radio or whatever. And I'm not trying to think that I'm not trying to say that I'm this a uh, huge deal because God, I'm certainly not, but I did think it was appropriate to kind of give that little bit of a background there about the bobblehead of the man behind me, Bob Millard, who's my grandfather and his right hand man, essentially the bobblehead of Mike Krzyzewski. Um, I just thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so it was, it was obviously in my family, it was a, it was a fun Saturday. Um, uh, you know, my dad, my mom, you know, my other set of grandparents, um, cousins, you know, sister, brother-in-law, I mean, huge, obviously big Tennessee fans. And then there's my aunt, my cousin, uh, whole family in Atlanta, you know, grew up Duke fans. And so it's been some trash talk and everything, but nonetheless came down to who was going to be more physical. And that was Tennessee in this one. And Tennessee does win 65 to 52. All right, back on to pressing matters there. Hope you guys enjoyed my little personal antidote. Uh, some of you guys may start threads on VolQuest.com talking about how much you hate me now. It is what it is. Uh, but yeah, that's my background. I thought it was funny too, because you know, for so long, I kept seeing like, oh, one of the mods is a big Duke fan. And they're talking about Brent. And apparently Brent was like, you know, watched Duke basketball in like the 85 and 86 season. And I'm like, do they not look at the stuff behind me? You can't see my top shelf if you're looking at YouTube right now, but there's even more stuff on that top shelf. But there's also Tennessee stuff too. This is a sports background. Uh, but anyway, okay, away from that. Let's get back to it. Uh, Tennessee's, what, what an opportunity for Tennessee. What an opportunity for the Vols. I mean, you've got a Sweet 16 date with the winner of tomorrow's Farley Dickinson game, the 16th seed that just knocked off Purdue, and Florida Atlantic, the ninth seed that just knocked off Memphis. That is your opponent. The winner of that game is your opponent in the Sweet 16. And again, tournament basketball, and I was talking about this on the uh, – the station clipping thing that I did Saturday with the uh, locked on network, like tournament basketball is never easy. And I would never say that, you know, that is going to be an easy gimme. You're going to the elite eight, especially when Tennessee's only been to one elite eight in the history of the program. But I mean, hello, would you rather play a 16? Would you rather play a nine or would you rather play a two or a one? You know, like, like you were going to meet up with Purdue in the next round. I mean, duh, you're going to want to play the 16 or the nine. What an opportunity for Tennessee. And isn't that just tournament basketball? Last year, you won like 13, uh, 13 of 14 or 15 of 16. You won the SEC tournament. You're at full strength outside of Olivier Cumwa. You're feeling good about yourself. And you go into the tournament with a head of steam. You blow through your first opponents. Then you lose in the second round. And then you have this team that's limping, that's limping, injury riddled, inconsistent ball games, can't close out ball games getting bounced in the second game of the SEC tournament, not even getting a top four seed in the SEC tournament, a down year, mind you, in the SEC tournament. It's what everybody, myself included, has said repeatedly this season. Um, and then you're on to the Sweet 16. How about that? That is tournament basketball. So you get the winner of the 16th seed for Lee Dickinson or the ninth seed Florida Atlantic. And you're going to play them at Madison Square Garden in New York City. Tennessee will be playing on that Thursday, Saturday uh, schedule that is when the East Region will be playing on the Thursday Saturday schedule, and um, that game to see who Tennessee is going to play either Farley Dickinson or Florida Atlantic. That is tomorrow Sunday night, 7:45 p.m. on True TV. So how about that? All right, last thing I want to do. Let's go over the stats here. Olivier Cumwa, 27 points, 10 of 13 shooting, man, five rebounds in 22 minutes. <laughs> and it's shocking because he was only plus three on the day. How about that? Man, Olivier Kamwa, 14 points, four of 11 shooting. All four of those are made three pointers, five rebounds. He was plus seven on the day. Excuse me. Excuse me. Santiago Vescovi. Uh, he was plus 16 on the day. 16 on the day. Let's see here. Jonas Adu finished with eight points, three of six shooting. He had five rebounds. He was plus eight on the day. Josiah Jordan James, 3 of 12 shooting, 1 of 5 from three-pointer. Manny started the second half off on a good a good stroke, right? A little three-pointer. Um, he was plus seven on the day. Four assists as well and five rebounds. Four points from Julian Phillips. Three points from Tyree Key. Two points from Jabai Meshack. The biggest plus minus on the day was Vescovy with plus 16. Man, Tyree Key plus 12. How about that? Toby Awaka in 11 minutes, he was plus 11. How about that? Tennessee shot on the day, 40% from the field, 23 of 57, 43% from downtown, nine made three-pointers. It really came on strong in the second half, nine of 21, and did better at the charity stripe. Not as well as you want, but did better at the charity stripe. Uh, 10 of 13, 
And when Tennessee had 18 turnovers on in round one against Louisiana, nine turnovers total, 15 turnovers for Duke. Tennessee was able to get, let's see here, if I can find points off turnovers, 18 points off those 15 turnovers. How about that for Tennessee? How sweet it is. Tennessee's on to the Sweet 16, and boy, oh boy, the path to the Elite Eight, it is looking good. Am I right? It's not a gimme. Nothing ever is in tournament basketball, and the way this Tennessee team has played up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down all year, it's definitely not a gimme, but you were going to take on the winner of 16-seeded Farley Dickinson or 9th seed of Florida Atlantic. That game is coming up tomorrow. A date at Madison Square Garden on Thursday in the Sweet 16, a chance at an Elite Eight. How sweet it is. Congratulations, guys. Hope you guys had a blast watching this on Saturday. We'll be back on Monday talking spring football and, of course, more of the Sweet 16 run for Tennessee basketball. Make Locked On College Basketball your second listen today. And uh, how about this? We'll try to get tomorrow or we'll try to get on Monday. This is Locked On Vols.